Hello, and welcome to the Chiswick Book Festival and the second day of our main festival weekend. We've got a full day of terrific events, and I'm delighted we're starting with another live Zoom session with two of my former colleagues at BBC News. Steve Richards is the author of The Prime Minister's Reflections on Leadership, and he'll be introduced properly in a moment. To do so, I'd like to welcome the journalist and broadcaster Phil Harding, who was previously, among other things, editor of the Radio 4 Today programme, director of news at the World Service, chief political advisor to the BBC Director General and controller of editorial policy. So, Phil, over to you. Thanks very much indeed, Torin. Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, live online event at the Chiswick Book Festival. Um, it's my pleasure to be hosting this session with Steve Richards. Uh, Steve needs little introduction, but uh, for those of you who know him, you will know him as one of the most perceptive writers on British politics today. And he'll be a familiar face and name to, uh, to you from his columns and from his many appearances on television and radio. And also for the last few years, he's been appearing on stage in a very entertaining and funny one man show called Rock and Roll Politics. And if you haven't seen that yet, I would heartily recommend it when it comes around. The book, as Torin said, we're talking about today is this one, The Prime Minister's, Prime Minister's Reflections on Leadership. Uh, I think the thing is the leadership bit as well, which is what we're interested in today. It's a fascinating look at the 10 men and women who have led this country over the last 55 years. So it goes from Harold Wilson through James Callaghan through Thatcher to write up today, write up to date, and tries to answer the question as to what is it that has made these particular individuals special? It's now out in a new paperback version with added Boris, because there's a new chapter on the current Prime Minister, and we'll come on to Mr. Johnson later. Uh, Steve, good morning. Morning, Phil. Uh, good to see you. Um, thanks for doing this, and very good to see you there. First question, I suppose, the obvious one, what made you want to write this book? Uh, I've always been fascinated by character in politics. I don't think by any means character determines what happens in politics and in countries and so on, but it is an important element. And I've always had a sense that when the media portrays prime ministers and indeed other figures, it lapses too easily into caricature and cliché. And I wanted to delve a bit deeper um, to find out what made these figures get to the very top, which in itself is an epic achievement, and then what often made them struggle when they had made it to that number 10 peak. Um, and I was always suspicious of uh, cliches about all of them. Blair, control freak, uh, Major, useless, uh, Cameron, lazy. None of it quite added up to me. If these were all true, um, they would have failed catastrophically before failure did indeed descend upon them. Mm. And so I, I'm just fascinated by it. There's a Shakespearean quality to leadership uh, and British politics that I wanted to explore with each of these characters. Now, near the start of the book, you uh, write a sort of mock job description and you say the country is looking to elect a prime minister and she or she must have the following qualifications. I won't read out the, the whole list because it's a long list, but it's a, it's a very long and it's a very daunting list. But there's two qualities there I just like to pick out because they're not perhaps immediately obvious qualities at the start of it. Um, you say he or she must be a political teacher. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I think this is one of the most underestimated uh, qualifications. It's almost seen as an added extra, whereas I think it's essential. If you look at the three big election winners in the period that I covered, they are Wilson, who used to show off that he, he always used to say, I won four elections out of five, which is a bad <laughs> the Labour Party winning elections. Um, Thatcher, uh, three, uh, two huge landslides and a very big third win in 79, and, and Blair. Uh, and each of them were instinctive 
teachers. They made sense or tried to make sense of what they were doing all the time. Now, it might have been nonsense, but they tried nonetheless. So, for example, Wilson always used to talk, as you know, in his early days, white hot heat of technology and how he was going to harness that and so on. Uh, Thatcher, you know, monetarism, a very complicated uh, idea. She used to just go around saying, my father with his grocer's shop never spent more than he earned and a country cannot spend more than he that earns. Now it's nonsense, but it makes accessible deep spending cuts uh, etc etc and Blair too he used to hold press conferences all the time and he used to say look guys we're on the radical centre all right uh, which means if you're rad if you want change we're radical if you want reassurance <laughs> but there was a constant sense of explanation now you compare that with those who struggle for various reasons uh, Theresa May uh, Gordon Brown Ted Heath by the way I think Heath and Brown were two of the deepest thinkers uh, of the Prime Ministers, but they struggled because they failed to be teachers. Brown was actually early in his career, but he lost the art of teaching. Uh, May and Heath never had it. And the fall of May is partly explained by her inability to teach. You look at her Brexit deal compared with Johnson's. Objectively, it is better, but she couldn't sell it. She wasn't a teacher. So I think it's an essential element of leadership. Is it also about finding the language to explain what you're what you're doing and why you're doing it? Absolutely. And the key is why. Uh, it's very interesting. If you look, say, at the Corbyn uh, era um, and he was regarded, you know, he could pack halls out. But he wasn't a teacher. He never, if you look at his speeches, explained why he was proposing what he was proposing. He would assert and he would list a whole series of propositions, but missed out the why. Interestingly, Ed Miliband, also someone who is more fascinated by the art of politics than Jeremy Corbyn, never really addressed the why question. Mm. Either. Mm. It is that mm. why question that links a leader with the wider electorate. You also talk about something else that I, I don't hear many people talking about with, with prime ministers, which is able to read the political rhythms. Can you say what you mean by that? Yeah, um, the best at this was uh, Margaret Thatcher. The political stage in British politics is very cluttered. A prime minister is rarely as powerful as many people think they are. And you have hmm. to judge all the time the amount of space available to you. So early on, Thatcher sensed that she wasn't trusted within her party. Most of her front bench viewed her very warily. They hadn't voted for her in the leadership contest, which she won in uh, February 75. So she moved quite carefully early on. Um, but then when space opened up, for example, when the Labour Party formally fell apart, the SDP was formed. She's thought, aha, a schism mm. in my opponent's half. I now have space. And it was then that she kicked out all those so-called wets from the cabinet or sent them to Northern Ireland. She brought in Norman Tebbit and others, and she went for it. And so reading that, um, Blair in 97 had far more space than he realised. He was dreadfully cautious and wary of one word from the Sun newspapers and so he moved more cautiously than he needed to. Um, you have to be conscious of that space. Um, some of them were quite clever at creating space. Cameron, who I think was one of the weakest prime ministers in this list on other judgments, um, qualifications, magically created space by uh, negotiating that coalition, which gave him, through I think partly the, the naivety of Nick Clegg, most of what Cameron wanted to do. So it is mastering limited room on the political stage that is an essential. You also you also talk about um, the use of humour, uh, and and the prime ministers who are good at humour and the prime ministers who are terrible at it. 
absolutely. And it immediately humanizes these people who tend to become distant figures who seem mightier than they are. If you use humor and you get people laughing with you, you have made huge progress. Now, Wilson was very good at this. Someone told me that Wilson learned to have a sense of humor, uh, but boy, did he learn quick. <laughs> so I'll give you an example. When Johnson did his first cabinet reshuffle, it was utterly brutal uh, in July, uh, the, the July when he became prime minister. Um, Corbyn popped up. I can't remember what Corbyn said in response. If you remember, Harold Macmillan did a brutal cabinet reshuffle um, where he sacked huge numbers of ministers. It symbolized the end of that period of Tory rule. And Harold Wilson just popped up and said, I see Harold Macmillan has sacked half his cabinet, the wrong half. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately people say, ah, yeah, they laugh. He, he looked, he's great. And part of Johnson's appeal, early on anyway, was this capacity to say, oh, there he is, he's funny, you know, and it breaks down barriers. Um, I don't think he uses wit as such, um, but people say, oh, that good old, good old Boris, he, he's a laugh. And uh, I think it partly, only of course partly, explains his appeal in labour areas of which this former Etonian editor of The Spectator has very little direct connection. Yeah, we'll come on to Johnson in just a moment or two. Thatcher was um, was famous for not having a sense of humour and indeed used to used to kill jokes. Yeah, that was definitely not one of her uh, qualifications for leadership. Um, famously, she had never heard of Monty Python's Flying Circus. Actually, one or two people tell me that she could be, she did have a sense of the absurd every now and again. I'm not sure. But um, no, she didn't. Um, so it just shows that that is not an essential qualification because she won three elections. But I think it is an important part of the political armory. And for example, Keir Starmer, if he wants to extend his repertoire beyond his highly effective questioning of Johnson, humour is, an, is, is a necessary addition. And will be yeah, I, th I think Thatcher once had some several crafted jokes put into a speech for her by her speech writers, and one of them was a reference to Moses and, and the tablets and keep taking the tablets. And she <laughs> crossed it out and rewrote it and wrote just keep taking the pills, and then <laughs> couldn't understand why and nobody thought it was funny. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, she was. Um, wars. Uh, conflicts, military conflicts, one of the most difficult decisions and probably one of the most heartrending decisions a Prime Minister has to make is deciding whether or not to go to war. Um, and you, in your book, there are obviously the two most obvious examples of Thatcher and the Falklands and Blair and Iraq. And you point up quite a big contrast in, in how you see how those two Prime Ministers tackled those two situations. Well, actually, I think there's quite a lot in common. And this is where I think this book does serve a purpose because it's it, when prime ministers go to war, this is when cliches and caricature really fall. So, for example, uh, when Margaret Thatcher went to war to regain the Falklands, it was portrayed widely as a great act of courage um, and boldness. And whatever you think about it, that's not what it was. If she hadn't gone to war, uh, she would have had to resign. That was the choice facing her. Uh, Enoch Powell, who she revered, actually said that. You have let go of these islands through your own neglect. If you don't recapture them, you must go. And she, she was of that view too. So, she chose the more expedient course of going to war. Um, and uh, it wasn't about courage. Obviously, once you've made that decision, you go through phases of hell as you await the outcome. But if she hadn't done that, I think she would have had to resign. Remember, it was under her watch that Argentina got the Falklands. 
So it wasn't about strength and courage. And similarly with Tony Blair and Iraq, in the build-up to much of the media said, whatever you think about his decision, you must admire his bravery and courage in fighting for what he believes. I think that's the wrong way of viewing Blair and Iraq. I think he saw it largely in terms of his relationship with the United States. And Blair, to understand Blair, you have to remember he lost, he was an MP when Labour were losing election after election. And he thought that was partly because of a breakdown with Middle England. It was seen as weak on defence anti the United States, and he was going to do nothing that reinforced that view. And first fought an election uh, in the aftermath of the Falklands War in 1983. Yep. Yeah, and indeed he was the Labour candidate in Beckersfield, the first by-election after the Falklands War. Yeah. And Robin Cook, who went to see him in the campaign, how struck he was by how popular Thatcher had become because of the war. And I think all these factors weighed on him as he made his moves towards Iraq. How does he keep Murdoch on board? How does he keep his Middle England coalition happy? Um, how does he keep the Atlanticist wing of the Labour Party on board? And it wasn't an aberration. Some, some people say Iraq was an aberration. It wasn't. He tried to find a third way in which he persuaded the US to go to the UN. Um, but as we all know, he had already told Bush he would be to quote him with him either way. And he got caught in a trap. Um, but as I say, it wasn't about courage in either case. Um, I've, I'm doing something at the moment about Suez, and it's very interesting. Again, it, in the build up to war, British politicians start to think, what what do I need to do to show that I am strong rather than what is the right thing to do? And I think that's Thatcher and Blair. You say Blair got trapped into supporting Bush. Um, what, what do you mean by that? Sorry, when I say trapped, that's a good question. Trapped by his own political outlook, which was that Labour had to be seen to be strong on defence strong on the relationship with the United States um, and, 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 and never breaking, if possible, with uh, Murdoch and his newspapers and its readers. And I think mm. that combination led him to conclude when he knew that Bush was going to go into Iraq, that he would have to be with him. And as I say, his third way option was to persuade Bush to try and go to the UN. And he frantically, uh, and he lost all sense of reality for a time, tried to get that famous second UN resolution when he was never going to. Um, so that was the trap, his own strategic overview of what it was necessary to be, to be a Labour Prime Minister. Now, I have to say, you know, Alistair Campbell and others tell me I'm wrong. He was, he just passionately believed that they had to get rid of the dam. Um, I, I think it was much more complicated than that. You, um, you I'll, I'll come on to Boris in just a moment, but one last question on this section. Um, you say that Labour Prime Ministers tend to regard themselves as imposters. What do, you, what do you mean by that? Yeah, well, this again is another example, really, of where um, I try and challenge the orthodox assumptions. So, I, I mean, I've, I've followed the new Labour era very, very closely and saw a lot of Blair, Brown and their advisors. And in the media, they were being portrayed as outrageously arrogant, um, you know, intoxicated by their own power. And when I saw them, I saw deeply insecure people thinking they would be kicked out at any moment, disturbing the natural order of things where conservatives rule and I would just give you one example. I could give you many. In about September uh, 1997, I had coffee with Blair in number 10. He was about 50 points ahead in the polls and everyone was saying he was walking on water. And we were having a chat about the upcoming Labour conference. And suddenly Angie Hunter rushed in and Alistair Campbell rushed in and said, William Hague has changed his policy on rural post offices. 
and blessed, well, what the hell are we going to do about this? You know, they were really, you know, get out a press statement. Are we going to change? What, what do we do? Is it our policy robust? I mean, on everything, they felt tested and vulnerable. And yet they were being portrayed as arrogant uh, to the point of monstrosity. And it was just wrong. It's because and there was an there was an element that they just couldn't believe this was happening. They couldn't believe that they were that far ahead. They couldn't believe that Labour had won an election after all those defeats. Yeah, I think Blair genuinely thought, even when everybody else in the build up to ninety seven knew it was going to be a big majority, I think he thought a hung Parliament was highly likely. They had been so conditioned by defeat. Uh, 1992 in particular, the fourth defeat um, in a row, that, um, yeah, they were insecure, they felt like imposters. Uh, and so, and, and, and the contrast is so interesting with Tory prime ministers. Uh, Cameron, even though he didn't win an overall majority in 2010, was far bolder in what he tried to do, if you think mm. about it public service reform, uh, real term spending cuts. Uh, he followed his agenda of, of radicalism from his perspective with much greater energy, fixed term parliaments, all kinds of things which we're living through now. Um, New Labour were much more cautious. Boris Johnson, the current Prime Minister, um, you list a number of faults which you point out quite rightly have stopped others becoming leaders of their party. And you say perceptions of disloyalty, transparent ambition, are reluctant to cultivate political allies. You go on to remind us that Boris Johnson possesses all of these faults, and yet he's gone on to become leader of his party and prime minister. Yeah, and I write to someone who uh, I did the series for the BBC on prime ministers we never had, and looked at the reasons why they didn't get it. And then I wrote an article saying uh, Boris Johnson has all those reasons as to why he shouldn't get it. Um, and he got it, which shows that um, my prophetic powers need to be treated with some caution. <laughs> also, I think that we're in a very different world. I think the reason he has got it when others didn't, who didn't cultivate people effectively, and he, he's a loner, Boris Johnson. Um, the reason he got it is, this extraordinary febrile period we're going through at the moment. I mean, it's easy to forget that the Brexit party topped the poll for the European elections um, in 2019 and the Tory party was slaughtered. And it was things like that that meant the Tory party panicked into giving the job to this figure who A, promised to get Brexit done uh, in quotes and B, seemed to have a popular election winning appeal. Um, but it was very interesting writing this chapter on Boris Johnson because it changed my view of some of the others that had preceded him. He is absolutely unique. In every, you, you mentioned one, that he got it when most who behave like him wouldn't have got it. Um, but in many other ways, he differs from all of them, even though... He's broken the mould. Completely. Um, I mean, you know, to, obviously what we're living through at the moment, we, we've got it in the Sunday Times... Uh, two former prime ministers, Major and Blair, who incidentally were at each other in 1997, coming together to condemn him for breaking international law on the basis, Johnson claims, of defending the Good Friday Agreement. Mm -hmm. They were the architects of the Good Friday Agreement. They say it's the opposite. Um, we have, there are endless examples. One I find very interesting is when he first became prime minister, it was a hung parliament. All the other prime ministers in hung parliaments, I write about Callaghan, Cameron, major towards the end. They all reached out. They all tried to keep their party together form alliances with other smaller parties, May, May with the DUP. He just went the other way. He expelled people like Philip Hammond and turned him into now sort of Che Guevara. And at the same <laughs> time, rather than wooing smaller parties, attacked all of them. And, and, and electorally, it was highly effective. I mean, he, he won in December, but it was a wholly different approach, which in the end will have, I think, deep consequences for the Conservative Party, obviously for the country in ways we know about, we're living through it. But I think the Conservative Party will be deeply shaken by this style of leadership over time.
he's a big risk taker he is a, he is a, he's a huge risk taker and continues to be you know if you are a successful risk taker on your terms you keep on taking the risks and politically i i, I read I, I just don't know but i read in his private life he's a risk taker big time but gets so yeah so we hear politically uh yeah one risk that what i've just described removing the whip from hammond ken clark oliver letwin i mean we're not talking here about left-wing insurrectionaries from the tory party was a massive risk driven incidentally by dominic cummings who is by any objective measure the most powerful special advisor to have occupied number 10 in history um these are, were all big risks he's taking a big risk now breaking international law um contemplating a no deal um these are epic risks but you're right he's a big risk taker it's it's he's inconsistent about many policy ideas and he's not rooted in any deeply felt part of the sort of tory philosophical spectrum uh one consistency is he takes big risks yeah it, it, just following up on that you 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 wrote a phrase that really struck me which is that he's not sure who he is as a public figure or as a prime minister yeah he, if you think about it um his performance as a prime minister is is, is very revealing um there has not been much uh clarity Th there is this leveling up agenda but just think about that phrase for a second um leveling up implies almost as if by magic you can boost the uh economies of say parts of that so-called red wall in the north of england mm, mm, mm. I'm not saying he's going to redistribute which you can understand whether you agree with this or not you can sort of say oh yeah i say so you're going to take from some people or area and put it somewhere else yeah so so i think he doesn't really know who he is remember he agonized over brexit uh, whether to be a remainer or a brexit year wrote two uh, columns columns um he has been a passionate supporter as london mayor of immigration he's now passing deeply repressive immigration uh, proposals um so i think he is all over the place and interestingly he's not an actor on one level it's it's a, it's an act but on another he's fairly transparent i think he cannot altogether hide the fact that he is both overwhelmed and confused about his his role at a moment of historic emergency and significance you also write that he he's a political loner and you compare him which is a comparison i wouldn't have thought of with theresa may on that in that point he's uh he's he doesn't have many political friends yeah uh, i i i think they such different public figures have mm. some things in common i was very struck when johnson first became an mp and by the way i was impressed i used to do quite a lot with him for radio four and you always said to me i want to go into politics and i admire people who do that um and i saw him when he first became an mp wandering around where mps gather in court cullis house looking shy awkward and alone uh he's a poor speaker in the house of commons when cameron formed that social set the so-called notting hill set where cameron osborne go the drinking late into the night getting the cigars out he was far removed in islington um you know uh, apart from all that and on one level like a lot of these people who light up in a studio he is shy and awkward as theresa may was as well gordon brown sometimes had that characteristic as well certainly i mean remember uh, uh a description of when he went into a summit he wouldn't go around the room glad handing he would sit in a huddle with his advisors and neil kinnock came up with a famous phrase which is gordon needs to learn strategic pleasantries <laughs> i think that it's i've always it's a phrase that's always um always always stayed with me um Dominic Cummings, you've already described him as probably the most powerful special advisor 
there's ever been. What what do you think is in that relationship? I think it's really interesting. By the way, not probably. I'm sure he is. Um, yes. Okay. Some people say to me, what about Alistair Campbell? And Alistair Campbell was a huge influence on Tony Blair, but largely about media. If you read um, Alistair Campbell's diaries, um, he doesn't reflect much on policy at all. It, it wasn't what interested him. He was interested in how to project that so-called project to a largely hostile media. Um, and in that sense, he was powerful, but in no other. Um, Cummings uh, is a, a obsessed with policy. He views the media with disdain. So policy and strategy, I'm convinced it's his strategy to break uh, international law and to stir it up. And the Sunday Telegraph has been briefed today that they're going to move out of elements of human rights legislation and so on. Uh, this is him. Uh, and he and, and the relationship is fascinating because I think Johnson is largely a loner. Um, he is, well, it, the two don't necessarily go together, but I think he's quite a bad judge of character. He's, he's never really had to sit and analyse people. It's not what he does. If you read his columns, it's not an analysis of public figures uh, in any meaningful way. Um, they were sort of polemics, you know. And with Cummings, I think he has decided he is the figure that fills the gap in his political armory. I think he thinks he's a genius. Someone told me, Johnson, who doesn't really pay that much attention to other people, when Cummings walks into a room, his eyes light up. Um, and I think he has decided Cummings got him through the nightmare of last autumn, which could have gone badly wrong. Cummings got him this huge majority in December. Cummings has now told him, stir it with the European Union. It will work electorally with our uh, coalition of support. Um, it will blow apart the European Union. Strategy. You know, I think he just follows what Cummings says. And when, you know, when he didn't sack him over the, the eyesight driving test of Barnard Castle, people said, what has Cummings got on him? It wasn't that. It was, he is, he has decided he's dependent on him. And I think it is absolutely the wrong call cool, um, and is, is going to, in the end, implode dramatically. But I think that is the nature of the relationship. Yeah, what you're describing sounds like a very dependent relationship. And, and yet, and yet, you point out that the Prime Minister is the one with the patronage. He's the one who decides on the, the style of leadership and the policies. So he's the one ultimately who's in charge. So he can he can make Cummings, but he could also destroy him. Yeah, and uh, Johnson said when some Tory MPs at a private meeting, when Cummings was in, you know, trouble at some other previous point, said, "Look, it's me. I've appointed him. I make the final calls." Uh, but he can also get. Rid of him. And another characteristic of Johnson is because he is distant and a loner. He doesn't feel great unyielding senses of loyalty to anyone and if he decides Cummings is a problem and not the solution uh, Cummings will go but I have to say people thought that might happen after the Barnard Carson incident absolutely none of it um, he is still the big figure in this administration along with Michael Gove of course and that relationship began when uh, Gove and Cummings worked at the Department of Education. Uh, Cameron incidentally sacked Cummings. Um, so they are the figures uh, of great significance in this administration. The rest of the government dance to their... Do, do, you, do you think Johnson or Cummings have any clear idea where they ultimately want to get to? I mean, it sometimes feels as though it's just government by throwing everything up in the air and seeing where the feces land. I think Cummings thinks he does. Um, but when you read his blogs, uh, you soon sort of enter a kind of weird world of high tech sci-fi. It's like a kind of, I don't know, some Stanley Kubrick film. I, so, but I think he thinks he does. So he's famously at the moment briefing columnists about the need for state aid to help subsidize uh, firms in Britain develop a high-tech future for the UK, for example. So that's where he does. I think Johnson is busts it. 
I don't think he quite knows what he wants or why he wants it, um, which is why Cummings provides this drive. Um, and, uh, you know, so, and, and, and explains the mess. I don't think they understand government. I think to, to fully appreciate this number 10 and how different it is from all the others, although, as I say, they were all unique in their own way, is it's basically a comp comp continuation of a campaign. It's the vote leaders mm. in number 10. And they are baffled when they pull levers and nothing happens because they don't really understand the structure of government, much of which incidentally, this government in its earlier phases created like NHS England, and public health England, and all these other things that happened in the coalition era. Um, and they get frustrated and angry. They look to blame, but always to campaign. And um, that's, that. I mean, the new Labour thing was partly about campaigning, but they did become obsessed with implementation as well. No matter how supportive or critical you are of this government, I think it can generally be agreed that they haven't dealt with the epidemic, uh, the COVID epidemic uh, at all well. Um, how much do you think of the government's slow and at times chaotic response to this pandemic can be explained by Johnson's inexperience, how much by his personal chaotic style, and how much by his laziness and inattention to detail? Uh, all, all of all of that, I think. Um, you know, if I, I think if you look at the beginning, uh, it was we still don't know, for example, uh, why Johnson did not attend any of those earlier. Uh, uh, Cobra meetings, the meeting set up to address what the hell the UK should do as the pandemic was raging across Europe. Um, and I think no other Prime Minister I write about in this book would have missed those meetings. You can't imagine Gordon Brown say, I can't be bothered this thing, you know, I mean, might be killing people in Italy, but we can sort it out and we'll just carry on. Uh, Theresa May, you know. So, um, that was a combination, I think, of this. It is, it's become a cliche, but this cliche is true. They've got a view of British exceptionalism, um, that somehow, you know, we, we will overcome these things and somehow we can move out bigger single and, and flourish. Um, so there was a bit of that. There was a bit of the libertarian streak. Um, there was a bit about an experience of government and how, the, how government works. Um, there was laziness, there was a capacity to get easily distracted. Um, and I think in that period, he was focused on Brexit, quite a lot of private stuff was going on. Um, he was sorting out his divorce, wasn't he? Divorce, announcing the pregnancy, uh, all of that was going on. And as I say, I, I just, you know, Cameron, who was not a great one for policy detail claims he didn't know what Andrew Lansley was up to with the NHS reforms. I don't think he would have missed those COBRA meetings. I think there would have been uh, endless conversations between him and Osborne about what the hell Britain should do. Was it prepared? Was the NHS structure ready for it? All this kind of thing. None of that went on. Uh, instead, it was fantasy world about herd immunity, um, keep the pubs open, go to football matches, keep, you know, the, it, it was extraordinary. and. Uh, and, and what has happened since has raised questions about the functionality of the state. You know, it is, it is very fractured at the moment. Um, and it is interesting that you hear people like Matt Hancock even saying the atomization of the health service is now a problem. Well, that was the goal of the Lansley reforms, which was... He doesn't have many people around him, certainly nobody in his cabinet, really who will say, hey, you should be paying attention to this. Hey, you should be at this COBRA meeting. Hey, you should be looking at this. There's, there's no, he sacked them all and um, he doesn't have any heavyweights around him. And this is a real issue. They're all scared of him. Uh, stroke Cummings. Uh, Cummings, in effect, got rid of a chancellor, uh, Javid, and put in Sunak. Um, he sacks, uh, Cummings has sacked special advisors. And it's not that long ago that Johnson won this big majority. Uh, by the way, prime ministers acquire authority only fleetingly, and it's when they've won an election big. And so he retains that authority. The cabinet know they are there 
on his uh, patronage. And so I think, no, you know, some people say, well, will the cabinet speak up against Britain breaking the law? No, they won't. Um, they will uh, pretend if they have doubts, which some will have, to support it because they are scared of him, Cummings, and know that if they put a word out of place, they'll be sacked. Now, that dynamic could change. If Labour move ahead in the opinion polls, uh, there will be more doubts about the Johnson-Cummings regime and cabinet ministers might dare then to become a bit more assertive. But at the moment, they say yes. And this is a real problem because if you're not challenged, uh, even a titan would make big mistakes and Johnson is not, not that. I've got a very good question in. We've had some questions in, I'm very glad to say, uh, in advance of this session. Um, this one's from a, a Mr. Hugh Sykes. I think it must be a Hugh Sykes that uh, we have heard on Radio 4 and we all know. Um, it's a good Very. Would it be fair to say that judging by his performance so far, Mr. Johnson desperately wanted to become Prime Minister, but now is not entirely sure he wants to be Prime Minister? Does he like the job now he's got it? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting question and it's one that fascinates me because we're again getting into the psychology of being a Prime Minister. I think he is now at the point of being torn. Um, at first, even though it looked as if it was going to be nightmarish for him, uh, the sheer novelty uh, gave him a huge boost and the fact that he had got there when he wondered sometimes whether he ever would gave him a huge ego trip. Um, my impression now is that he is torn, um, that there are still moments when he cannot believe it. And all prime ministers go through this, that he has reached the summit that so many fail to do. And I think he does still occasionally convince himself that he is either Churchill or Roosevelt, the two figures he has openly compared himself with, farcically, by the way. Um, uh, but I think also now you can tell from his performance that he is taught um, that, that he has become overwhelmed by the scale of the COVID challenge and is finally facing up to the logic of Brexit, which whatever you think of it cannot, if it's a hard Brexit, deal with the Irish question. Mm -hmm. And um, so Theresa May tried to do it by saying we will wait for an in inverted commas technology to deal with it. And in the meantime, we'll stay in the customs union. So there's no border in uh, between Northern Ireland and Ireland. He dumped that and basically agreed to a border uh, across the Irish Sea. And he's now trying to get out of that. And it, all of that is clearly going to be a burden on him. And I remember him saying once to me, when he was a journalist in the new, early New Labour era, he said, uh, politics is the new rock and roll. Now, he wasn't just referring to he was a columnist. He wasn't just referring to that, although he was already becoming a media star, but the whole glitz of New Labour and so on. And I do think that was the drive. He, he loves the, the, the glitz and the sense of destiny that being a prime minister should uh, give someone like him and he suddenly found it hellish. Um, so my reading of it is he's torn at the moment, but the hellish dimension will become stronger as we uh, go, th go through this period with him. Looking towards the horizon, you talked about the contradictions in, in Europe and there are a lot of contradictions there, but e and when it comes to economics, they've got one uh, looming at some point when they have to start paying uh, for, for the epidemic. Um, he's not a cutter. By instinct, he's a he's a big state state person, and you talked about Dominic Cummings indeed wanting to give state aid to technology companies, bring back Harold Wilson and the White Heat for technology, spotting winners and all of that. But there is going to be a contradiction, isn't there, because between Johnson and Cummings wanting big state solutions, spending money, and a lot of his supporters and his backbenchers who are cutters. Yeah, this is uh, one of the reasons why I think at some point. This is going to lead to a major sort of identity crisis in the Conservative Party, because if you think back since pre-Johnson, since 1979, basically Thatcherism has prevailed uh, long after she left. Her, 
her hold over her party remained extraordinary. And that incidentally includes Cameron and Osborne. Cameron made big claims that he was this great modernizing figure. He was actually more Thatcherite than Thatcher in his economic policy. She never did real term spending cuts, he did. Uh, now all this has been disowned by Osborne, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Johnson and Cummings. Uh, the leveling up, as I was saying earlier, implies, you know, borrowing to spend because they're not claiming to do it through any other means. And um, th there was a very interesting exchange uh, in the House of Commons recently where uh, Edward Lee, a Thatcherite Tory, stood up and said, don't forget us Thatcherites, we're still here, you know. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. This is going to be, in a way, a divide that's harder to manage than Brexit, because all the Tory MPs have signed up to Brexit at the December election. They are broadly committed Brexiteers, or they've accepted it's going to happen. But this divide between a small state and a much bigger state is, is, is going to continue to be a theme. Okay, Steve, you've written about uh, 10 prime ministers. We're getting down to what I guess is uh, a key question that a lot of people have raised with us, and I'm going to go to get to it by uh, two or three questions. First of all, Tracy Shepard, is Johnson the worst prime minister ever? Well, that's a sweeping question, but I will answer it by saying, so I, before I do, and I promise you I will give a yes or no in a minute, given that I said earlier, I'm the book is partly to challenge cliches and assumptions about all these prime ministers and the cliches about Johnson uh, from his critics, and I'm a critic, is uh, that he is lazy, reckless, untrustworthy, etc. So I have to hesitate and question whether I've bought the cliches, but I've studied him very closely and I do think all these things apply. And I think that if I were have, having to measure it, whether you're Tory or Labour, I'm not, there's no point getting to it's boring whether we're Tory or Labour, but I think these last three Tory prime ministers have um, been extraordinarily weak in terms of leadership. Cameron, for a certain set of reasons, a lot of what we're living through now originates with that Cameron era. Um, he didn't have to call that referendum, by the way, for example. He really didn't have the form of go. Um, May, I think, was really poor. She was a person of great integrity and she worked very hard. But if you can't communicate what you're doing and you cannot even manage your cabinet uh, through fear, as Johnson does, or through charm, you're really paralysed, as she was. Uh, but I'm going to answer your question. I think uh, on the basis of what's happened so far, yes, I think that the... Um, the breaking of the international law, the claims about an oven ready deal, which uh, either you knew not to be true or that you were planning to violate at a later date, going over to Northern Ireland and telling business leaders there'll be absolutely no bureaucracy and borders when you'd signed up to a deal which said there was, and so on. Um, the expelling of very senior Tory party figures um, who actually would have a lot to give at the moment on COVID, even if you ignore them. Yeah, yeah I think he, I, I think so far, uh, yes. So I'm taking, Roger Collins has sent in the question, do you think Boris Johnson is the best person to heal our country? I'm taking, I'm taking your last answer as a no to that, but let me go on to ask you the other half of this question. Who would you select from the current Tory party to lead yeah, that's a really interesting question because this question might arise, who knows? Um, uh, and as you all know, a lot of people are now saying uh, it's got to be Rishi Sunak. I think he's in a very difficult position, partly because he is now seen as the likely next prime minister, which is always a dangerous place to be in. Most yeah. likely prime ministers never become prime minister. Yeah. Uh, he's also got to make some very unpopular policy decisions in the near future. However, he conveys a certain expedient solidity. And if Johnson goes, it will be in the context of deep crisis. Either he goes of his own volition, having won a huge majority, or they force him out. You're in Thatcher territory, forcing someone out after a big election win. 
and a party then should go for a sense of solidity. So um, if I were a Tory MP thinking about this, A, I would be thinking, do we need to remove Johnson Cummings? And B, I would then move towards Sunak. Some people say Michael Gove, but Gove is very clearly and directly involved in um, the Cummings Johnson project. So that would you discount Jeremy Hunt, who seems to be playing quite a canny game? Yeah, it's a good question. He definitely wants it um, and and it will go for it. And uh, yeah, if I were a Tory MP, I would be tempted because, again, he conveys that uh, calm solidity, which is what you will want if you throw out a prime minister. Um, however, um, I think Sunak at the moment anyway seems to personify freshness and newness and that's another bit of the political armory that can't be underestimated but I don't buy into the fact that he's brilliant because he's done some very popular things um, however if I were a Tory MP I think I'd be looking to him. Okay last question just as we come to a close um, you've told us who the worst prime minister of these 10 was who do you think was the best? It, it depends, you know, this is much harder. It depends where you stand politically, partly. But so what I will do is something different. I mean, I personally disagreed with a lot of what she did, but there's no doubt if you look at the 10, the one who set out with a clear project, a uh, deeply contentious project, and not only implemented it, but went much further, and managed to win election after election in doing so, uh, you have to cite uh, Thatcher. But I do that with many qualifications. I mean, I do think she was a brilliant communicator by instinct. Um, but contrary to mythology, actually, I don't think she was a great uh, follower of policy detail. I mean, you sell council houses. OK, well, then what do you do about affordable housing? And she never... Mm. She never mm. So uh, it's with, with many qualifications, but if you judge it on what someone sets out to do and what then happens, um, she, 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 she meets that. Steve, I think you've met all of these 10 apart from Harold Wilson. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, it makes me sound about 95, but something <laughs> <bad>. um, <laughs> uh, uh, Yeah, I, let, uh, to give you one example, I grew up in Thatcher's constituency and my job, she was, I think she was education secretary, was at the school, I was at, you know, I was only at primary school and I had to show around the, the stalls, that was my job. And she, um, at the coconut shy, she grabbed the ball and threw it at the coconut. <laughs> I thought, God, there's a sign of things to come. I, okay, my question then is, of the ones you've met, who did you like the best? Oh God! Um, I, I, if any of them, if any of them, I do. I I didn't dislike them because I, I find them so interesting and in a way that's deeply unfashionable. I understand the dilemmas they face, so I kind of um, I found them all interesting. I, I'll tell you the ones. I'll, I'll answer it in a different way because I think. The, the ones who, who I found quite stimulating were often the ones who were then not successful prime minister. So the conversation with Gordon Brown was amazing. I mean, you, he would range from what the Archbishop of Canterbury was writing to some <coughs> to, you know, some 19th century economist. To the, I mean, it was an astonishing kind of range, which was, um, and it's, also populist things he was he's the only prime minister who was genuinely absolute passionate football fan um but he wasn't able to convey any of this I, I found them all interesting i think like is the wrong wrong way of looking because you know i was sort of seeing them as a journalist not as friends you know and i i yeah. not have friends with any of them some journalists are friends with these people and i that's fine um i i, I wasn't friends with them but I did, I, the, the two I spent most time with, and it was a lot of time, was Blair and Brown, a lot of okay. time. Okay, I won't, I won't ask you which one you disliked the most, because that's a very unfair question. <laughs> Steve, that is, that, <laughs> that is a fabulous session. Thank you very much indeed. It's, a it's been a fascinating 
just short of an hour. It really has been great. Thank you very much indeed for that. If, if For those of you who are watching, please do get hold of the book and read it. It really is uh, a fantastic and interesting read, um, thoughtful and compelling, as the Observer called it. It's very good indeed. Thank you, everybody who joined us. Thank you for joining us at this session. Thank you to the Chis Chiswick Book Festival team who've made this session run so smoothly and enjoy the rest of your weekend or whenever you're watching the rest of your day. Thanks, Steve, and thanks everybody. Thanks, Phil, and everybody. And thank you very much, Phil, for steering us through that so uh, immaculately. And Steve, uh, uh, as Phil said, that was brilliant. Um, I mean, we were absolutely uh, uh, enthralled. So thank you very much. We've had one comment on YouTube. So from Michael Robinson, so interesting on Johnson. If I hadn't already done so yesterday, I'd go out and buy Steve's book right now. Uh, now you can buy on our website. We've got a page on the Waterstones online website. Uh, other online uh, distributors are available and indeed there are bookshops that are open. Uh, so choose where you'd like to buy, but please uh, do. It's now out in paperback with that extra chapter about uh, Boris Johnson and uh, it's certainly well worth it.